All right, Ninat, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> okay, good morning for our Japanese colleagues. Uh, uh, good uh, evening here in the United States. I'm Petros Sofronis, uh, director of the International Institute for Carbon Neutral Energy Research. And uh, I would like uh, to welcome everybody to our seven webinar seminar in our webinar series that uh, we carry out uh, since uh, the start uh, of uh, the pandemic. Uh, our webinar series uh, is uh, intended to bring uh, in Eisner and at Kyushu University leading scholars from uh, all over the world uh, in order to present uh, their recent uh, accomplishments, their research uh, views on developments in, uh, in, in areas that are of uh, tremendous interest uh, uh, to Eisner's uh, research uh, portfolio and, uh, and uh, vision. Uh, the purpose of these uh, seminars, uh, seminar series, is uh, to uh, instigate, as I always say, robust uh, discussion and exchange of ideas so that in the end we all uh, live uh, with uh, a feeling of, uh, of uh, accomplishments uh, that uh, we, we realized uh, where we are and perhaps we think together about the future. And uh, without further ado, I would like uh, to pass uh, the administration of this uh, seminar to Professor Takahashi, who is uh, our expert uh, in this uh, field that uh, Professor Milkovic is going uh, to go forward. Professor Takahashi, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning and good evening. Everybody, uh, I'm Koji Takahashi, uh, Kyushu University uh, Eisner. Uh, today, uh, we have a special speaker, uh, Professor Nenad Milkovic, uh, UIUC. Um, uh, let me uh, introduce him uh, briefly. Uh, he received a uh, bachelor degree in mechanical engineering from University of Waterloo in 2009 and master and doctor degrees in mechanical engineering from MIT in 2011 and 2013. He is currently an associate professor of mechanical science and engineering at UIUC, um, where he leads the energy transport research laboratory. Uh, he is the uh, uh, associate director of the Air Conditioning and Refrigeration Center, which is supported by 25 industrial partners. His group's research intersects the multidisciplinary fields of thermofluid science, interfacial phenomena, and energy. Um, so far, he received so many awards. Uh, so, uh, let me skip <laughs> such so many uh, introduction, but uh, uh, today I'm so happy to hear his uh, recent uh, topic. So, uh, Professor Nenad Milkovic, uh, please start your talk. Okay, you guys can hear me, correct? Very good. Okay, good, good. Uh, thank you, Takahashi Sensei, for the great introduction. Thank you, Petros, for facilitating this, and thank you, all the participants, for being here. Uh, good morning to all of you and uh, good evening, Petros, to you. Um, today I'm going to give you a talk on a common theme of research that we do in lab. Um, you can see the title here, um, looking at understanding fundamental degradation mechanisms uh, of interfaces, hydrophobic and hydrophilic, um, and discussing a little bit about how they could be used uh, to develop enhanced two-phase heat transfer processes. So very briefly, before I start talking about the research, I thought I'd give you guys a little bit of motivation on why it is that we do what we do in lab. Um, so the main motivation for the work that we do in lab is understanding nature's design. Uh, for example, why is it that many plant species show resistance to uh, wetting or uh, are super non-wetting, depending on the kind of structures they have uh, on their uh, cuticles or wings or other body locations, such as eyes, for example. 
So what you're seeing here in the top right is work looking at uh, the cicada insect. And this is work that I've demonstrated before uh, at previous Eisner meetings, uh, where the cicada has actually evolved to have these kind of uh, very small scale nano features uh, that actually give it anti-reflective properties, uh, antibacterial properties, as well as high non-wetting or super hydrophobicity. Where we wanna use this knowledge from nature is to actually give us inspiration to develop advanced energy and water applications. So things like uh, power generation, distillation, desalination, um, HVAC and R, known as heating, ventilation, air conditioning, thermal management of electronics, as well as manufacturing. And, and down here is kind of a little bit of a vignette of the previous things that we've done, looking at brazing processes, icing. And then on the bottom right here, uh, an actual power plant demonstration that we've been working on with Abbott Power, which is a plant located here on campus uh, that I'll talk a little bit about, uh, which is very relevant to the work I'm going to talk about today. So what's a presentation without videos, right? They say uh, 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 a picture is worth a thousand words, or a video is worth a million. Um, a lot of the, the research that we do in lab spans every two-phase process in reality, whether it ranges from icing on surfaces, uh, brazing and brace flow between gaps for enhanced manufacturing. We think a little bit more about scale up and uh, not sticking only at lab scale, thinking a little bit about how we actually take some of these interfaces and coatings and put them on real life products. Electronics cooling of wide band gap semiconductor devices where high heat fluxes are very important. And then also kind of straying away a little bit from just working with water and thinking a little bit about other very relevant process fluids such as refrigerants, or petrochemical fluids, uh, which are very important as well from an industrial standpoint. And so we do all this by really focusing on, on five different scales uh, that I'm showing here on the left. The first one is doing fundamental studies at different surface tension length scales, looking at refrigerants at low surface tensions all the way up to liquid metals. We span temperature scales in terms of cryogenics for frosting and icing all the way up to manufacturing and braze flow, thousands of degrees Celsius. We span length scales, right, from nanometric, very fundamental studies, all the way up to, you know, tens of meters length scales in terms of actual scale up of nanoengineered coatings. And then time scales, right, hydrodynamic processes, droplet coalescence, uh, flows uh, in microscale phenomena, which are very fast, all the way up to multi-year durability studies, which I'll talk a little bit about here in this study. And then this final axis here is looking at both fundamental and applied research, which is really what we try to balance in lab uh, whenever we work on really anything uh, that we wanna handle. Now, part of the reason why uh, uh, I feel this talk is, is important or should be shared is because of what I typically term the, the coding conundrum. And this is basically this Venn diagram to, to help you understand where we are in the thermal science community in terms of uh, development and where more work needs to be done. So if we think about coatings for thermal applications, uh, typically you don't want a very large parasitic thermal resistance by putting your coating down onto the material. You typically want it to be very thin, hundreds of nanometers all the way up to one micron. There's been lots of work uh, over the past century on developing functional coatings, showing fantastic performance. But at the same time, if we want things to be durable, we want the coatings to be thick. And here we're talking tens of microns all the way up to hundreds of microns. Things like paint, for example, that you would put on any consumer product or on your walls in your home. And these two requirements actually oppose one another. In one case, you want a thick coating for durability. In the other, you want a thin coating for heat transfer. Then on top of that, if you wanna be able to handle low surface tension fluids, that's yet another uh, uh, Venn plot here, which typically water or a surface designed for water is not the same as it is for refrigerants, just simply due to the molecular interactions between water and the surface. And ideally for my lab, this is where we try to play. We try to play in this intersection of all three, and hopefully I'll show that to you uh, through this talk. So fundamentally, when discussing, you know, those issues of durability and coating thinness, um, you know, I call it the coating conundrum, but in reality, it's a really hard challenge, mainly from the perspective that if we, if we were to look at the intrinsic material properties of common materials, and if we were to plot something like the surface energy as a function of the thermal conductivity of the material, we see that what we want is a high thermal conductivity for thermal applications. But at the same time, we typically want a very low surface energy for phase change heat transfer applications. And in reality, these two are mismatched because the majority of materials which have high thermal conductivity, uh, like clean metals, metal oxides, uh, ceramics, 
um, uh, semiconductors, they typically have a very high surface energy and water uh, or other refrigerants will wet them spontaneously. Meanwhile, where we really wanna be, uh, we actually wanna have low surface energy like polymers, but the majority of polymers actually have very low thermal conductivity. Now, at the same time, if you look at the ultimate tensile strength of common materials, and plotted as a function of Young's modulus, you could see that these fantastic materials for coating applications, which are up here, uh, looking at carbides, uh, graphene, allotropes, um, um, common materials, metals, uh, that actually have very high strength, uh, they actually are also uh, very low surface energy. At the same time, if we look at natural plastics, elastomers, which are common materials for hydrophobicity, they both tend to have small ultimate tensile strength and small Young's modulus. And so I have it down in these three bullets down here that we, what we'd like is uh, low surface energy we know have poor thermal conductivity, good thermal conductors such as metals have high surface energy, and low surface energy materials have low Young's modulus, which is really what, what drives the research we do in lab is to try to develop coatings which can overcome these challenges and mix and match these advantages of the different materials that we develop. So I want to talk a little bit more about why is it that, you know, you typically need a high thermal conductivity coating, especially for a typical application such as phase change heat transfer, which is a big topic area of research for uh, power plants, as well as a lot of areas of research within Eisner itself. So for thin coatings, we're talking about less than 100 nanometers, we know they're preferred for heat transfer, but they're not durable. And so what we could see here is if we were to actually look at what condensation, for example, of water looks like on one of these coatings, hopefully this video plays, uh, maybe it's still loading. Um, essentially what you're gonna see and what you see here from the still image is the formation of small water blisters. And what you're seeing here is small droplets that are liquid droplets growing on the surface on the coating. And then these blisters form beneath the droplets, uh, which actually delaminate the coating and remove it from the surface. And the reason this thinness is particularly important is if you were to plot the decrease in your overall heat transfer coefficient of whatever heat exchange application you're using as a function of the coating thickness, you could see that as your coating thickness increases, right, uh, for the actual phase change heat transfer application, you could actually have a decrease in your overall conductance approaching 10 to 50%. Meanwhile, if you were to go to lower efficiency heat transfer applications, such as liquid cooling or air cooling, this is not as much of a constraint. And this is why typically using paints for air-cooled heat exchangers is okay. But for what we're targeting here in terms of steam condensers uh, and for phase change heat transfer, coating thinness is very important. And that's where the majority of the durability issues, which I'm gonna talk about arise. So from a more grand perspective in terms of society, Right, you might ask, well, why is phase change heat transfer important? And I've already I've already mentioned it once in terms of power plants. Uh, typically, in the majority of steam-based uh, power cycles around the world, uh, we're talking nuclear, uh, fossil fuel burn. So whether it's natural gas or coal, um, these use steam as the working fluid. And what ends up happening is the actual condenser in the power plant cycle creates the suction pressure on the back end of the turbine which actually drives the steam to go from the boiler through the turbine to extract the enthalpy and to generate the power which we all use today. Typically this condenser is just a bare uh, metallic tube. It could be copper nickel, it could be steel, it could be stainless steel, depending on where you are around the world. But what ends up happening is this condensation process tends to form a very thin liquid film, as you're seeing here in the top left image. This liquid film basically inundates the surface and it causes a barrier to heat transfer which reduces the efficiency of the heat transfer from the steam side to the coolant side, uh, where typically you have multiple tubes with water, coolant water flowing on the inside. Now, well over 80 to 90 years ago, a gentleman in Germany by the name of Schmidt uh, discovered that if you take one of these tubes and if you actually take animal fat and just spread animal fat on the outside of the tube, what you're gonna see is something called dropwise condensation. And you see this in the video on the right here, as well as this bottom left image where distinct droplets form on the surface, they coalesce, they grow, and eventually they'll actually shed from the surface and be removed. And it's actually this dropwise condensation process, this renucleation, this clearing of the surface, which makes this heat transfer phenomena 10 times more efficient than film-wise condensation. Uh, just so you know, given the crowd here, there's been a lot of work on dropwise condensation actually all over Japan, but a lot of work uh, from the 60s to the 70s 
especially at the University of Tokyo, where a lot of this work was actually being developed. So there's a rich history here uh, of Japanese contributions. So if we think about in terms of what steam power plants provide for us, we're talking about 80%, 85% of the world's electro ele electrical capacity. They also use approximately 100 trillion gallons of water each year. Power plants are the biggest water consumer in the U.S., and so if you could actually increase the efficiency of these plants by one or 2%, uh, that's actually a very large offset in terms of carbon emissions, uh, reduction in fuel burn, reduction in CO2 emissions, and reduction in water consumption. And this is why this problem is so important for us as a society, because if we want to decarbonize, we really have to make an, an inroad here um, on, on developing technologies that could actually use dropwise condensation and not just keeping them to, to academic settings. So if we look at what uh, uh, typical dropwise condensation behavior is like on a common surface, like a self-assembled monolayer or a polymer film, what you'll typically see is, is you'll actually coat the surface uh, very early on, you know, one second to one minute, you'll see droplets. But then very quickly within 30 minutes, you'll see film starting to form on the surface. And this is actually degradation of the surface uh, due to some mechanism, which uh, up until maybe five or six years ago was unknown. If we look at polymer films, it's the same thing. We start seeing blisters form that, as I showed you in the previous image. And after about 16,000 hours, we, we lose the dropwise condensation. In terms of the heat transfer coefficient, you could see here in the plot on the right, you start out fantastic, you know, 60 kilowatts per meter squared Kelvin. And then within hours, you're actually down to the performance of bare aluminum, which is not where you wanna be. And this just kind of shows you the main challenge to this problem in that very thin films are very hard to make durable enough to actually sustain dropwise condensation for a long time. This, this has been known for the past five, six centuries. So the very first thing that, that we wanted to do as a research group uh, was think a little bit about why is it that these blisters form um, to basically develop an understanding of what can we do to film chemistry, to film structure, material, uh, thickness, what are the problems that we're, we're looking at and what are the problems that we're missing? And so to give you an idea of what these blisters can, can look like, uh, this, is a, this is a little bit of a vignette of the different kinds of surfaces which we first fabricated to see how these blisters form on polymer films after coating them on silicon wafers or metallic substrates. The video on the left, this is a top view uh, video of water condensation just from the atmosphere. Um, from top down, what you're actually seeing is the substrate is being cooled. These are actually water droplets, these kind of uh, dark circles. And these larger irregular shapes are actually the blisters forming. And what you'll see is you could actually have water droplets growing on tops of blisters and blisters actually filling up with water over time and then slowly delaminating the film. We looked at a, a multitude of different surfaces, you know, PECVD of, of a Teflon-like substance on silicon. We looked at uh, different manufacturing techniques, spin coating of Teflon AF, uh, polystyrene on glass, as well as uh, polystyrene on sapphire to vary the, the adhesion properties of the substrate. And, and everything we did, it kind of showed us very qualitative results, uh, nothing very quantitative. And this, this kind of made us take a step back and think a little bit about what's happening and how can we actually develop materials uh, rigorously, understand them really well, uh, and then develop uh, uh, clean experiments to help us understand why is it that these blisters are forming and how we could prevent them. So the first hypothesis we had based on uh, optical microscopy was that actually these, these blisters are pinholes in the coating and they're, they're basically there because of defects during manufacturing. So what you'll see typically is if you take one of these polymer films uh, deposited on a silicon substrate, and if you were to put them in a scanning electron microscope, you'll actually see small defects where during the deposition, a crack will form or there'll be a dust particle which will be on the surface where the polymer coating will not be able to conformally coat the substrate. Now, if we look at a time-lapse image of what condensation ensues and how it occurs next to a blister, interestingly, what you could see is actually talking of droplets growing adjacent to a blister through the blister, which was direct confirmation that these blisters are actually water-filled. So what you're seeing here is droplet one, two, and three, a blister in between them, they'll glow large enough, and then droplet one will actually be injected inside the blister, and the blister will keep growing, and then droplet number two here, the blue, will be injected back into the blister and be uh, pumped into droplet number three. 
And this actually makes complete sense from a Laplace pressure mechanism where droplets having high curvature will actually flow towards droplets having low curvature, or in this case, through the blister having low curvature into the adjacent droplet. And so this was a first insight in terms of that uh, uh, proof that these blisters were actually water filled and giving, giving us some insight to the presence of these pinholes that are actually on the blister itself. What these pinholes end up doing is actually exposing the surface substrate for condensation. And this is actually also in agreement with previous studies looking at condensation on hydrophobic substrates where the critical supersaturation for condensation typically is on the order of two to three. But experimentally, what, what experimentalists always show is that typically whenever you condense on a hydrophobic coating, you will see condensation very early on at very low supersaturations as if the coating was hydrophilic. And this makes complete sense because if you expose a substrate, you expose OH groups, you have a high surface energy and the coating itself will behave as a hydrophilic coating. So to give further proof to the presence of these pinholes, you know, SEM for us wasn't enough. We actually uh, took a look at a, another characterization technique called Rutherford backscattering spectrometry. Uh, this is actually a very interesting technique where what we could do is uh, take a substrate, deposit our coating. We then actually sputter a 10 nanometer deposition of gold, which is directional on the coating. We then do a lift off process to remove the coating. And then we could actually do Rutherford uh, backscattering spectroscopy or spectrometry, RBS, to actually see whether we could send, sense heavy metals and actually get their density. And what you're seeing here is actually that spectra, uh, looking at oxygen, aluminum, and indeed we get this gold peak saying that we actually have gold platelets or clusters left that are actually there because the pinholes uh, have been filled and deposited. And this again is an SEM, this is before liftoff and after liftoff on a silicon wafer, you could actually see these dense pinholes that are actually left over as proof of our hypothesis. So at this point, we decided, okay, let's take a step back. You know, these coatings which we're putting down are kind of inconsistent, you know, depositing PECVD of a Teflon-like substrate uh, or, or substance like C4F8 is not very rigorously characterized. So we worked very hard to develop a, a uh, system in which we could really understand what, what we're depositing, what's the chemistry, what's the bonding state, what's the thickness, what's the thermal conductivity, that we could then use to develop experiments to really help us understand the mechanics of this process. So in this case, uh, uh, we do AFM to characterize roughness of the films we develop. We do RBS to actually get things like density of the films. Uh, we do FTIR to actually see the, the bonding of the amorphous groups, the carbon and fluorine of our fluoropolymers. XPS to see the actual chemistry, you know, whether we have CF bonds, CF2, CF3, and then a process called TDTR, time, time domain thermal reflectance, to actually see thickness, uh, thermal conductivity, as well as parameters like Young's modulus, we could actually get from the acoustics of the reflectance uh, within the film itself. And these then now allow us to form a, a subset of characterized proce processes that we could actually then develop a mechanics model to understand what's happening. So the first thing we did was, is we looked at the blister shape and how these blisters grow and what they look at look like. And what I'm plotting here is the central deflection of the blister. This delta is actually the distance at the center from the, the tip of the blister to the substrate itself. So think of this as a small hill and then the height of the hill is what I'm plotting here. This is for a, vari a variable number of coating thicknesses. So these different lines represent different coating thicknesses. And this is the height as a function of the radius of the blister. And you can see these, these, these basically linear behaviors form. It turns out that you could actually normalize this by the height uh, or by the thickness of the film, which is H. So if you take delta over H and call it delta star, you could also form a mechanics-based non-dimensional radius. You could actually see that the majority of these collapse onto uh, one particular curve. In this non-dimensional radius, this is based on plate and membrane theory. G is the adhesion to the substrate. Nu here is the Poisson's ratio. E is the Young's modulus. And H is the thickness of the film that you're depositing. And so what that enables us to do now is to think a little bit, how can we now have control pinholes to actually study how these blisters form? And can we actually control the geometry and the size of that particular pinhole to see how the blister mechanics change? And so what we do here is we use a, a process called nanoindentation. This is a diamond tip that we actually take and we indent uh, very finely into the coating in the substrate to form a defect. 
then we could actually watch how this blister grows and know these parameters through the uh, uh, in situ AFM imaging that we do. And indeed, what you're seeing here are phase scans in what's called an environmental AFM, where you could actually condense water while you're doing the AFM analysis. And what you're seeing here is the defect. Uh, this is the polymer film on the outsides. This is the defect itself in this little triangle. If you condense water, you'll see that water will actually form and fill the blister. And again, this, this phase scanning tells you that this green is water and the rest is a very uh, uh, non-polar, non-interacting substrate or, or substance. Um, so again, further, further verification of our hypothesis that this is how this delamination is actually occurring. So if we were to look at two different cases, uh, in this case, two very different uh, defect geometries and sizes, uh, both geometries are triangular, but very different sizes. You can see on top here, we have large defects and on the bottom here, we have small defects. What you're actually seeing is as you condense on these, if the defects are quite large, you'll actually get water forming within the defect, but not delaminating the substrate or, or the coating itself from the substrate. If you actually have very, very small uh, uh, defects, you'll actually have the blister fill and you'll have delamination occur. And these are actually interference fringes because we have an optical filter. And so it's telling us that there's something about the size of these defects inside the coating, which is governing whether delamination of the coating occurs. This is very important. And so a very clever student of mine uh, looked a little bit at previous uh, theory uh, called plate and membrane theory, essentially looking at if you were to have a plate and if you were to have a hydrostatic force on one side forming something like a blister, what kind of pressures are generated within that plate um, and how these can be used to understand deformations as well as forces that are actually occurring hydrostatic, hydrostatically on the water within the blister. And so what, what he came up with was this parameter called omega, which is basically the, the Laplace pressure within inside the blister normalized by the pressure of the membrane pushing down and not wanting to de-adhere from the substrate. And you could see here that this omega or this non-dimensional pressure is a function of the geometry of the, the uh, defect itself, uh, the surface tension of the working fluid to the power of four, the elastic modulus, the adhesion, and the thickness of the coating itself. And so it turns out this parameter itself can actually tell you whether you're gonna have blistering or de-wetting. And we could actually vary it for different coating thicknesses and see that we could actually have a regime of blistering or a regime of de-wetting, depending on where we are for this particular material. And so what this enables us to do now is create a regime map based on this omega and actually plot uh, where we wanna be in terms of the coating's Young's modulus and what we term as the wet adhesion, which is this G. It's basically the coating adhesion to the substrate. And so you could see here that uh, where we wanna be, which is basically these dotted lines for a particular thickness, which is where the regime is durable. This is kind of where we are in terms of the state of the art polymers. We have fairly low Young's modulus, fairly low wet adhesion. Inorganic coatings have very high Young's modulus, but they have fairly poor wet adhesion. So ideally where we wanna be is actually for very thin coatings. Uh, we wanna be up here in terms of our wet adhesion and Young's modulus, for example, for whatever coating we develop. So for state-of-the-art coatings, uh, we're talking about a wet adhesion of 10 millijoules per meter squared, Young's modulus of one gigapascal, and a thermal conductivity typically of 0.1 watt per meter Kelvin. Really where we wanna be is an order of magnitude higher for every one of these parameters for whatever coating we develop. And so I'm gonna shift my talk a little bit now and, and discuss three different approaches that we developed using this theoretical framework, this, this experimentally verified theoretical framework to develop a subset of coatings which are very, very promising candidates to solve this problem finally. And so the first approach we took was how do we develop coatings which are pinhole free? Because you may ask yourself, well, if you could remove pinholes completely, you're not gonna see any of this happen. And so we, we looked at previous literature and one particular idea that we liked was self-healing coatings. And this is actually work which uh, was pioneered here at Illinois by uh, uh, Nancy Sotos and uh, Scott White, as well as others in the chemistry department. Typically the way these work is a coating where it's encapsulated with a what's known as a payload. If you scratch this coating, the actual payload can be released. This can be an epoxy kind of formulation and the coating itself can heal and any pinhole that's formed can actually be filled. 
Uh, this can actually be done with capsules or it can be vascular based. And there's been lots of fantastic work on this approach published in great journals like Nature and Science. Part of the problem with this approach is the fact that these capsules have a limitation on how small they could be. Given that we want the coating to be fairly thin on the order of you know, a micron or less, it turns out creating these capsules is actually very hard uh, to do uh, for that particular thin coating application. So we're, we're a little bit limited on what we could do with, with this sort of salting approach. It turns out that during my time here, the material science department hired a very talented young chemist or material scientist named Chris Evans, who was actually working on this problem already, thinking a little bit about dynamic polymer networks. These are vitrimers. These have been around for 50, 60 years, but they've actually never been studied as thin films, which was actually very surprising for us. Here, the ester size or a dynamic bond size, basically switching bonds between different molecules or atoms is on the order of one angstrom. So this is well within that range of thickness that we need for our particular application. So in this case, because of this dynamic bonding that occurs in these uh, PDMS-based formulations, if you were to cut this material, and then if you were just to simply compress it together, it will actually heal and you'll have a perfect material again. And so this to us was very exciting and, and why we first started this work with in collaboration with uh, Chris Evans. So that same student of mine who, who developed the mechanics of these thin films uh, uh, and, and their ability, then went on to actually do some pioneering work thinking about how we could actually make these dynamic PDMS strands, inject them with dynamic boronic ester crosslinks, and really make them into very fine 10 to 100 nanometer thin coatings. So this is basically a schematic of the way the coatings work. Uh, you actually have these uh, uh, covalent bonds which can actually switch dynamically uh, depending on the location of these boronic esters. And so what actually happens is we actually work with the manufacturing to vary the thickness as a function of the annealing temperature to prove that even very thin films that we form still have these boronic esters. We actually do a, a mapping of FTIR. This is FTIR AFM. And indeed, if you were to actually take one of these materials, this is a very thin coating that we actually scratch using AFM. What you'll actually see is that what we call here Dyn PDMS, dynamic PDMS, after you scratch it, it'll actually dynamically self-heal. Whereas if you were to take a conventional chemistry like CFX, this is a non-self-healing polymer, this is what the scratch looks like after you're done with it. So there's no self-healing, there's no flow. Um, the, the defect is actually left inside the coating. So this was first proof to us that this actually works and could have good potential for dropwise condensation. The student then went on and did a lot of very interesting work using the nano indenter to actually put uh, pinholes. You can see here, these are actually pinholes that, that form on a conventional surface. If we place these same pinholes on our self-healing surface, we don't see anything happen because of the self-healing. If we were actually to do mechanical scratches, like physical, you know, hundreds of micron scale scratches, you could actually see the same thing. The coating will self-heal. You'll have nice uniform uh, uh, dropwise condensation after you condense on the surface itself and right? after it self heals. So it, it basically doesn't see the scratch at all here, whereas the coating without uh, the self healing, you'll actually see a very thin film form within the scratch and no droplets are actually formed within here. And then finally, uh, what we have going on right now is a long term study looking at how long these could last. This is just a schematic from the paper that we published just comparing it to, to a typical polymer film, where within 80 minutes, the, the entire polymer film will delaminate, whereas our surface shows absolutely no uh, sign of degradation after 17 days. Now, again, this is ongoing, 17 days is not long enough. What we need is more like you know, 10,700 days, but that will take time and we will get there. So please be patient with us. So uh, the second approach that I'm gonna um, um, change angles on is looking at how can we actually increase the, the parameter called G or wet adhesion? And so this is actually a fairly interesting uh, uh, theme of research, mainly because a lot of people within the community don't quite understand the fundamental criteria of developing coatings for wet applications. What I mean by this is everybody thinks, or, or not everybody, but a lot of scientists think that the adhesion of a coating to a substrate in air is the equivalent thing of the same adhesion of the coating to the substrate in water. And if you were to ask them, well, you know, which one do you want? Do you want good dry adhesion or good, dry, or good wet adhesion? They may tell you that for condensation, well, you want good dry adhesion. It turns out that that's completely incorrect. What you actually want is a coating which has 
very high wet adhesion because what you want to do is what, what lipid bilayers already do uh, in nature. They will actually uh, prevent water penetration between the substrate and the coating uh, by actually making a hydrophobic hydrophobic interface and thereby energetically not allowing the water to actually come into the, to, to the crack and not allowing the blister to form. And this is very important for us because we know that, that the relationship between this blister height and the blister radius is heavily dependent on the adhesion itself to the coating. And so these are just some experimental measurements looking at the apparent adhesion versus the reversible wet adhesion. And indeed we get a fairly linear relationship telling us that we're on the right track here. So what you're seeing here is actually a condensation on a surface that's been promoted with Teflon. Again, I hope it uh, plays here, this video may not play, but essentially it has a uh, fairly good wet adhesion. It could actually have a negative, uh, sorry, it has a good dry adhesion. It could actually have a negative wet adhesion. And some people will say, well, what does that actually mean when you have a negative wet adhesion? It actually means that water will preferentially want to displace the Teflon. So what will happen is if you condense, water will preferentially get underneath the substrate and it'll want to stay there. So schematically, uh, because the video is not playing, what will end up happening is you'll have blisters form very quickly. The coating itself would float and it will be removed completely by the condensate. And this is not good. And so even though you could actually achieve a coating with fairly good dry adhesion, it actually gives you characteristics during condensation which are very poor. You definitely don't want. Oh, now it's playing. So what you're seeing here is condensation. You could see blisters forming and oh, just like that, the coating is actually removed. So this coating right now is actually floating. And so let me, let me see if it plays again. It may not. Oh, here we go. So condensation, droplets, blisters, coalescence, done. The coating itself is floating and moving around. And so again, this is all because of those thermodynamics, right? You, you want good wet adhesion, not necessarily good dry adhesion. And so like I already mentioned, it turns out nature already does this. If you were to look at a phospholipid bilayer, these bilayers will actually reorient to actually have the hydrophobic tails facing each other. And what this does is it actually creates a nonpolar, nonpolar interface. It says having a sandwich of two hydrophobic materials, water will definitely not want to enter within that interface. And so what you could do is you could actually look at common materials and plot the polar component of the surface energy and the dispersive component of the surface energy. And ideally, this is actually lipid uh, tails. They're down here. And we have different chemistries where if we promote uh, the surface with like a self-assembled monolayer before we actually put on our coating, we could actually achieve very high wet adhesions all the way up to 100 uh, uh, millijoules per meter squared. So in terms of the similarities, these are ultra thin coatings. They require high underwater adhesion and they actually don't rely on chemical bonds, which is a misnomer typically taught within our community to a lot of our students. And so uh, what we did now is we looked at a uh, structured surface. This is actually just a copper oxide based structure. What we do is we deposit a very thin coating of a self assembled monolayer chemistry, FDTS, which very conformally puts the chemistry down on every part of the surface. So you could see here, if you were to look at what water does on this surface on the left, it completely wets. If you were to promote it with FDTS, it's super hydrophobic. And then on top of that, we deposit another polymer layer, which then forms that hydrophobic, hydrophobic interface, which has a very high wet adhesion. And then on top of that, because of the roughness, we have an apparent wet adhesion of all the way up to 800 millijoules per meter squared. And so what you're seeing here is condensation on our, what we call our bilayer coating, right? Very durable droplet jumping. I apologize for the sound in the video. And then here, this is what happens on the coating, which only has the polymer on it. You could see that it degrades quite badly. It doesn't work very well. And so to really prove this work, we actually put this experiment, uh, and it's been ongoing for more than a year. You could see the year 365 days. We have stable droplet jumping. So, so the way I like to plot this is operational time is a function of coating thickness. And these are all different studies that have been done in the past. 10 to 20 years. This is our work up here. And this is actually very exciting for us because it's actually a very simple uh, design guideline that's been overlooked by many people in the community. And if you want to learn more, 
Um, it's it's about to be published in ACS Nano. We just went under second review and just have some minor revisions. So I anticipate this will be out within the next two or three weeks. And again, if we were to look at different materials, right? You don't have to use FTTS and, and uh, C4, F8. You could use a range of fluorinated or non-fluorinated materials. You could use a range of different uh, organic compounds to actually form that base covalent layer with the substrate. And you could see here, the green is actually what will work and give a very high wet adhesion. And these materials here, uh, combinations have fairly, fairly poor wet adhesion and may not work for dropwise condensation applications. In the red here, I'm basically uh, giving you chemistries which are fluorinated based. Uh, fluorinated compounds are actually being banned by many countries. So what we wanted to provide here was design guidelines using materials uh, which are hydrogenated and not necessarily fluorinated. And then finally, um, I'm gonna end my talk by discussing a, a probably the most exciting uh, approach or, or breakthrough for developing these durable hydrophobic coatings by really looking at hard materials. So one approach, we talked about defects. A second approach, we talked about G or the wet adhesion. This third one, we're mainly gonna be talking about both G, the wet adhesion, and E, the Young's modulus. And so here we were actually inspired by previous work looking at noble metals and rare earth oxides, uh, which are basically non-organic uh, compounds, which were claimed to be hydrophobic, but it turns out they were not hydrophobic at all. They were just basically being uh, uh, adsorbed with volatile organic compounds and becoming hydrophobic over time. Another class of materials, which, uh, which really, you know, they have carbon, so you could call them organic but they're not quite organic because they, they, they don't form typical hydrogen and carbon bonds that, that you would see in these thin polymer films um, are, are diamond-like uh, carbon, right? So basically diamond-like carbon is a uh, amorphous material which you deposit on your substrate, uh, which actually has diamond-like bonds, but it also has van der Waals graphite-like bonds. And this range of sp2 to sp3 bonding is what you could tune during the deposition to really make either really hard coatings or surfaces or soft coating surfaces. Diamond-like carbon can also be uh, combined with fluorination uh, by a co-deposition in what's known as fluorinated diamond-like carbon. And there has been some work on this published maybe 30 or 40 years ago, but nothing very conclusive. And we asked the question, why can't we make this work, especially given that we have this new framework for durability? And so the material that we came up with uh, uh, that holistically takes into account defects, uh, defect density, uh, uh, multi-layer formulations for preventing uh, uh, pro or forming tortuous paths from top surface defects to bottom surface defects, uh, stress relief uh, by gradient layers, uh, co-deposition of fluorine in the top layer to form this FDLC. We actually call this coding FDLC, and this was developed uh, in combination with a company called Orlikon Balzers, which is based out of Europe. Uh, they're the biggest uh, DLC supplier in the world. What you're seeing here is XPS spectra of our coating as a function of the X-ray energy. And you could see the different uh, uh, elemental composition within the coating, depending on where you're looking. This is a four layer formulation. There is the substrate, the silicon. There is a layer of titanium, which is actually the adhesion layer to actually hold everything down. There is a formulation of DLN and DL, uh, DLC. DLN actually having a high silicon content to give it high thermal stability. Uh, th this coating can actually hold up to 300 degrees Celsius. So we're not talking about polymer coatings here. Uh, DLC being conventional diamond-like carbon and providing us with a buffer in terms of uh, material properties to have a gradient uh, in the material properties. And then uh, at the end, this 500 to 600 nanometer layer where we co-deposit a fluorine chemistry with diamond-like carbon to really give us a volumetric hydrophobicity. If you were to look at the load profile as a function of indent depth during nano indentation, you could see that FDLC has metallic-like properties, whereas this kind of CFX formulation, which we typically use and a lot of groups use, we're talking about you know, four gigapascals here we're talking about on the order of 80 gigapascals. So it's a very strong material. If we were to look at the thermal conductivity, we see that it's, it does have a polymer-like thermal conductivity of 0.3 watts per meter Kelvin. And what we're plotting here is the contact angle as a function of substrate. And you could see that we could actually make this very versatile 
for a range of different substrates, it works quite well. Um, there are a few substrates where it's actually hard to actually do this deposition, but for the majority of engineering-based substrates, uh, we actually get fantastic performance. We actually then go and measure the heat transfer performance. This is the chamber that we used in lab. Um, this is actually nothing but a vacuum compatible high pressure chamber where we could mount samples, in this case, tubes. And we have coolant flow on the inside of tubes. We actually visualize the flow. And you could see down here, this is what condensation looks like on the FDLC tube, as well as comparison to the bare copper tube. And you could see in the right here, the condensation heat transfer coefficient as a function of vapor pressure and comparison with theory uh, for, for both particular experiments. And we, we get good agreement with theory and what we expect. So the coating itself is exceptional in terms of the heat transfer performance. It's not actually degrading the heat transfer. Now, uh, in terms of the thermal, chemical, and mechanical robustness, uh, we've actually done a, a number of different experiments. What, what I'm showing in the top left here is the advancing contact angle and the receding contact angle as a function of the exposure time, exposure in terms of a, a high temperature environment. So the dotted lines, are for HTMS, which is a self-assembled monolayer, conventional in nitrogen. And the HTMS in air is the dotted blue lines. The FDLC in red is a nitrogen and the FDLC is in air. And these temperatures, I believe, uh, were 250 or 300 degrees Celsius of exposure. And you can see that the FDLC actually maintained its performance over time, whereas you get significant degradation uh, of this HTMS formulation. Same for the receding angle here on the right. Now, what we could do is we actually have a Tabor tester and we could do mechanical abrasion of the interface. And what you're seeing here is that for up to 5,000 mechanical abrasion cycles using a diamond tip, we could actually still maintain stability for dropwise condensation. So what you're seeing here is an SCM of zero cycle, an SCM of 5,000 cycles. And on the bottom here are focused on beam cross sections of the coating at zero cycle and 5,000 cycles. And it's indistinguishable meaning that the coating is very ardent, it's very adhered, and it actually lasts for quite a long time. Now, you know, the proof is in the pudding. Anybody will say, well, Nanad, you know, you haven't shown me a multi-year test, right? How do I know this will last in a real steam environment? It turns out we actually have an answer for that too. This is a chamber that we built uh, more than five years ago now. It's actually currently still going strong. It's a vacuum compatible chamber that we could actually mount samples to. These are samples in the bottom left here that we mount that we could actually observe dropwise condensation and how it changes over time. And so we actually put, you know, whether it's smooth copper, just as a reference, as a control sample, HTMS, Teflon, C4F8. And then on the right here, you're actually seeing these diamond-like carbon coatings, uh, which have been in there for multiple years. And I'll get to the final message. This is actually a three-year uh, test showing dropwise condensation stability for up to three years on carbon, aluminum, and silicon. You could see that, you know, we've got 716 days here. I actually have to update the number of days because you can see this doesn't actually quite add up to three years. Uh, but this is for the, the paper that we were writing at the time. Um, we've still got ongoing data and we're continue to we're actually continue to do this experiment. Uh, we haven't stopped it. It's currently working in lab. So we're, we're very excited by this. Um, and and uh, you could see down here, we've had a little bit of a snag uh, with a long review time with nature and arguing with reviewers about the importance of this. Uh, but ideally we could publish this in a high impact uh, journal paper in a place like nature or science to really get the message out uh, that we've, we believe we finally solved this problem. So to summarize, um, I, I'm not gonna belabor this point. Uh, what I've shown you here is a, a kind of step back and thinking a little bit about, you know, if we're gonna solve any of these interesting problems, it's very important first to understand what's actually happening uh, using materials and methods that are actually rigorous. Only then are we able to then develop criteria to develop coatings and surfaces which, could, which can last and be engineered to last uh, for whatever conditions that are important. And so far I've talked to you about uh, self-healing coatings, which, which get rid of pinholes, which we showed were important. Uh, coatings with high wet adhesion that are inspired by nature and lipids and diamond-like carbon coatings, uh, which are the most recent work that we've been doing. So just briefly, uh, Takahashi Sensei, I think I, uh, yeah. I have five minutes or should I end it here? Yeah. I keep going? Yes.
Okay, okay. So just briefly, I only have a few slides here to show you that, you know, we, we, we're, we're not only a one trick pony, we don't just do condensation. Um, I always like to show a little bit of diversity and a different kind of research that we've been doing. We've been thinking a little bit more on uh, the side of evaporation or boiling as well, but then also at the same time, keeping within this theme of how do we make durable surfaces? How do we make, how do we make durability? How do we make things last? And so in this case, typically what people will do is they'll use oxide-based formulations to form an oxide with a particular structure on a particular substrate. What ends up happening is you then form a distinct interface between the pure metal substrate and the oxide, which you're putting on top. These have different coefficients of thermal mismatch. They have different properties. They have different solubility and different fluids. One thing we've been looking at is how can we actually crystallographically etch metals to form a metal structure which could actually be durable enough but also large enough to be relevant for flow boiling and in this case this is actually refrigerant experiments looking at the heat transfer coefficient as a function of different mass flux this g here is the mass flux not the adhesion and you could see for the surfaces that we've made here we could actually have an enhancement of about 300 percent we also measure pressure drop uh, we can measure void fraction and then durability over multiple day tests and then do things like demonstration on real fin tubing, which would actually be used within industry. So not just on plain tubing, but something a lot more relevant. And we're kind of very excited by this work and, and being able to now focus on super hydrophilic surfaces, which are durable um, and, and moving a little bit away from the hydrophobicity. We're also excited by recent work and progress on uh, metallization of electronics. Uh, this is actually spin-off work from an initial study, which we did three, four years ago, looking at how we could uh, create immersion cooling in water or dipping our electronics directly in water using hydrophobic, hydrophobic polymer coating. What you're actually seeing here, and, and please don't call me crazy, you're looking at a PCB board with two different gallium nitride devices mounted on it that's actually been coated with copper. This is actually copper right on top of your electronics. And many people, when they see this, they think, well, you know, Nanad, you're out of your mind. You're going to short circuit this thing. There's going to be leakage current. It turns out that there's multiple different uh, advantages to using functional polymers in combination with electroplating, which can give you ultra high performance uh, of this particular technique. So we're, we're very excited by this. The initial paper was in IJHMT. This paper is actually in second revision in Nature Electronics and 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 hopefully it gets published. Uh, this is work that I, I think will really be groundbreaking uh, within the, the thermal science community. And then lastly, this is the last topic I'll touch on before I end my talk. Again, I talked a little bit about scale up in the beginning of my talk, thinking about how we take these from lab scale to real heat exchangers. And many of you have seen this actually at, at presentations at Eisner. This is work where we looked at frosting and how we could actually take these frosting paradigms and put them on real heat exchangers. And so we look at, you know, micro scale, how do we now apply it to real heat exchange uh, with real actual experiments with airflow. And then you can see here that the proof is in the pudding, right? The, the actual frosting behavior is much slower on the super hydrophobic heat exchanger compared to the bare heat exchanger. And if you were to plot the heat transfer rate as a function of time, you could see that it increases, right? You hit steady state and then you maintain it for the super hydrophobic heat exchanger Whereas for the bare heat exchanger, you decay because you form frost on it, you grow thermal resistance and you have poor performance. And so what we've done now is actually work with Ford Motor Company. Uh, this is an actual heat pump application for an electric vehicle uh, where we've actually been able to demonstrate this in a transcritical CO2 cycle on an actual electric vehicle platform with refrigerant flowing inside the actual heat exchanger. And again, heat transfer, pressure drop data, uh, much better performance, much fewer defrost cycles. And in terms of the overall performance, our scalable nano-engineered uh, microgenal heat exchanger shows a coefficient of performance of 2.1 compared to 1.5 on the bare heat exchanger. And this is the actual study that's been published by my postdoc, Allison Mavi, who is now faculty at uh, Wisconsin Madison. And then finally, uh, I forgot about this slide, we've also been looking at additive manufacturing and how we could actually combine surface structuring with additive manufacturing to really give us really interesting co-design and topological optimization to develop what I call here, you know, our alien condenser, our condenser that, that you know, you don't have to worry about manifolding, you don't have to worry about joining, about fouling. Things can be made very aesthetic and, and very engineered. 
So with that, I want to thank the people who did the work. I didn't, I didn't do this work. I just present here and uh, I take all the, all the glory. Uh, Jing Cheng Ma is, is that very bright young student who, who is actually finishing his doctorate this May. He's actually going to move to the University of Chicago to, to be a postdoctoral fellow, uh, looking a little bit more into biological systems. Uh, Jahid and Longnan and uh, Deep led the FDLC study. Uh, Longnan is now a faculty member back in China. Um, Jahid uh, is currently looking for postdocs, and Somya Deep Set is a faculty member back in India. And again, for my collaborators, Professor David Cahill and uh, Professor Evans, funding sources and the group. Um, and with that, I will leave it here and open it up to any questions. Okay, uh, thank you, Nenad. Uh, today we have uh, more than 80 listener audience, uh, which is uh, evidence of your very excellent uh, 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 topic. So uh, I can uh, accept uh, questions or comments from the audience. Uh, please raise your hand. Uh, using, uh, the... I think there's a question in the Q&A uh, by, by Takara-sensei. Oh, yes. Yeah, I guess maybe I can read it and uh, I can answer it too. First, Takara-sensei, hello. I didn't know you'd be here, uh, but it, it's great to see you. I hope to see you in person soon. Um, okay, I have two questions. Do you know any coding substances which can repel low surface tension liquid? Uh, I, I wish, I wish Takara-sensei. This, this is a very good question. Uh, aimed at you know how do we how do we make uh, refrigerant phobic surfaces for dropwise condensation? Uh, we have been working on this a lot, and we've gotten all the way down to uh, I want to say pentane. Uh, so we've made we've made uh, uh, ethanol repellent, hexane repellent. Uh, we went on xylene because xylene was an important fluid for uh, a lot of petrochemical applications and solvents. Uh, and then pentane, and we just had a paper in Advanced Functional Materials, which will be out any day now. It's been accepted, um, looking at this work on, on these dual-layer coatings. It turns out you could use a very smooth formulation, and then you functionalize it to lower the surface energy, and it actually works quite well. Uh, but nothing with refrigerant. So we're, we're still working on it, um, but hopefully, you know, one day we'll get there. And the second question Takara Sensei had is, is it possible to predict where the blister starts to develop? Yeah, so, so if we actually put our defects there, that's very easy to predict because our defects are the, the ones that we engineered in there. It's very difficult to predict uh, on a surface which we aren't putting them on there. So these pinholes that actually form on the surface, um, they can be formed because of local de-wetting, the processing, uh, whether you're making them in a clean room that's level 100, level 10, level 1, dust particles. Um, so there's lots, of, there's lots of potential mechanisms, which I don't really want to speculate that I really understand exactly why that particular defect density forms. Um, but that, that is something that needs more work. So it, it's a good question, but I don't really have a good answer for you. Okay. Uh, Dr. Yasunaga, can I talk? Can I speak? No. If so, uh, please use our uh, Q&A. And- Somebody uh, has a raised hand. Oh. Uh, okay, somebody's hand is up. Oh, and yeah. they have a Japanese name. Hold on, let me see. Oh, uh, I, think, I think I have to allow them, okay. Ask to unmute. I'm not uh, Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, Dr. Yasunaga, please start. Yeah. Thank you very much for the very interesting uh, presentation. Um, I'm uh, Yasunaga from Saga University. Um, uh, sorry, I eventually I had a uh, um, posted uh, my I raised my hand, but uh, uh, because it's a big opportunity to so, or uh, let me ask something about the, the, the now you uh, presented about the the flat plate or the tube plate of the the coating, and 
the, do you have the, any experience or more rough, high roughness of the coating is um, if it is uh, affect uh, on the um, the 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 heat transfer or the 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 any um, availability uh, or the durability on uh, uh, of the coating. Thank yeah. You. So okay. So th thank you. I, I just want to clarify. So do, when you say roughness, do you mean roughness of the substrate or roughness of the coating itself? Uh, not the coating. Uh, I mean the the roughness of the the the, the materials on the base. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's a good question. So there's there's two limits there, right? Then there's the inherent roughness of uh, a processed copper nickel tube, which you may use in a power plant. And I discussed a little bit about Abbott power plant. Um, uh, typically, if the if the roughness is on the length scale of you know tens or hundreds of microns, even due to like milling marks, um, it's it's okay. The coating itself will actually come down conformally, and it'll it'll cover the roughness uniformly. Um, so we we I don't anticipate it being a, a limitation. Um, we tend to use smooth coatings because of just the simplicity of the material characterization. Uh, but but maybe you're on to a point there that it's something that we have to look a little bit more deeply at in terms of how, how that inherent roughness may affect uh, durability long term. Um, your second question, uh, or that leads me to the other limit. The other limit is that a lot of applications will have um, roughness that's engineered. So for example, I, I showed those little micro finned, uh, like low fin tubing for refrigerant applications or for chiller applications in a, in a refrigeration cycle, uh, you'll actually have uh, uh, radial tubing on the outside of the chiller tubes and helical tubing on the inside, which is actually meant to be there for film drainage. Um, and in this case, ideally what we do is we develop a coating which can be 10x better to now enable the company not to have to put those fins there because those fins are actually quite expensive. And so from that perspective, that'll be more on the large scale, on the small scale uh, roughness that I first talked about. Um, there's nothing there that would tell me that these paradigms wouldn't work, but it's something that we could maybe look a little bit more into. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And we have uh, uh, four more uh, Q and A question. Uh, the first one is uh, Dr. Shin uh, about the uh, non condensable gas generation. Yeah, yeah. So please comment on the chemical compatibility with water. Okay, so chemical compatibility with water. Um, we haven't seen anything that comes out, you know, in terms of like being soluble with water. Um, there's definitely other coatings like uh, liquid infused surfaces, which we've also worked on that I haven't talked about here, uh, where you may have miscibility issues with the working fluid. Uh, but in terms of compatibility with water, um, out of the coatings which I talked about, I, we haven't seen any issue and, and theoretically I can't think of one. Um, and can these be used inside heat pipes without any issues of non-condensable gas generation? Um, yeah, I mean, these are very thin formulations that are very stable. You're talking about covalent bonds um, and, you know, non-condensable gases are very important in terms of, you know, even like five parts per million will, will uh, ruin your heat transfer performance. Uh, but for the, the surfaces that we've used and the timescales we've used, we haven't seen any effect of outgassing um, or swelling or, or, or that sort of problem, um, especially for, for things like fluorinated diamond like carbon, where really, you know, it's really hard covalent bonding, very stable. Um, so hopefully that answers it. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question from uh, uh, Dr. Wang. Uh, how about the uh, uh, heat transfer performance uh, using your self-heating material? Yeah, yeah. So, so for self the self-healing work, um, you know, we were very excited about the publication. We got it into a good paper, and and it was mainly more about the mechanics and the mechanism of making these thin films even more so than condensation, even more, you know, using it for other applications, biofluidics or just durable hydrophobic surfaces for abrasion applications. Um, we've had, what we've been working on now is, is thinking about how, if we could do something like chemical vapor deposition uh, of those boronic ester formulations and tuning parameters that's actually never been done uh, for this particular chemistry. 
And we've been we've been working with the Evans Group to think how we could actually do that because that in the end will end up helping us coat things like tubes, which we could then characterize for heat transfer performance. Um, but right now the coating thickness is on the order of you know 100 nanometers. It's actually even thinner than a diamond like carbon. So I don't anticipate seeing any uh, degradation in heat transfer performance because of coating thickness. Um, and just based on the dynamics of the dropwise condensation that we observe optically, um, it should give us that same enhancement uh, that we expect. So it's, it's a very good question and it's something that we still have to do, it's yet to be done. Okay, and also uh, Dr. Wang want to know that our problem of cost, uh, expensive or uh, low cost? Yeah, yeah. So that's that's a good question. Um, I'll comment that the that the FDLC cost is probably the most uh, uh, low out of everything that I talked about, mainly because diamond-like carbon, and this is actually what led me in, into diamond-like carbon, is the fact that it's actually already used in many applications for anti-wear. Um, and this actually started out by a visit to British Petroleum uh, in, in London, where they were looking at diamond-like carbon for uh, coating injector nozzles for fuel injectors. And, you know, the engineer was telling me, look, this is a coating. It's so adherent. It gives you great lubricity. It gives you fantastic properties in terms of uh, adhesion, great adhesion and great uh, friction resistance. And to, to myself, the first thing I asked him was, can you make this hydrophobic? Or can we actually co-deposit? Or... And then this kind of snowballed into looking at different formulations. It turns out this company down here that I'm showing, uh, Orlicon Balsers, is quite large. Um, they already do uh, a physical vapor deposition of diamond-like carbon. You know, we're talking about marine engines, so things the size of my room. Um, so it's it's a well-established technology. It's not something which is niche. Uh, definitely the most expensive uh, idea here would be the boronic esters, PDMS types of coatings uh, with dynamic bonds. Um, but there, it's not necessarily there's a shortage of material. Like, it's not like we have a shortage of boron in the world. Um, it's just more because it's a new idea and there's not a lot of capacity there for the need for it. And so, you know, it's, it's like economies of scale. It's like anything as this, as this pervades and as more people need it, prices will come down um, and hopefully things will catch on. Okay, uh, one more question from Japanese audience uh, uh, about the uh, nanoscale thermal conductivity. Probably, uh, uh, do you consider our, our heat conduction uh, as a, a different from the macro scale uh, heat transfer uh, using the uh, yeah, dead thin film or uh, pinhole or something like that? Yeah, yes, yeah. so this is a good question. I know I know there's a lot of very good uh, nanoscale conduction heat transfer research in Japan, and I have a lot of colleagues in uh, in Japan at different places that that are doing some fantastic work. Um, for for the majority of the coatings, especially the DLC, which we characterized, we're talking about on the order of two and a half microns thick. Um, so so not something which is so thin that you're approaching you know the the scattering length of phonons where you would be in a you know non Fourier regime. Um, everything we do uh, in terms of thermal conductivity, uh, we use time domain thermal reflectance, uh, and and we get the stamp of approval from David Cahill. So we are we are very happy with uh, uh, with our results, and we haven't really encountered anything where we where we really need to look at um, you know non Fourier conduction and and uh, measurement of of um, mean free path of phonons and kind of work that Austin Minich does and Gong Chan and, and others in the community. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, probably uh, you have more uh, questions, but uh, it's time um, to close this uh, very excellent seminar. Uh, Professor Sofronis, uh, do you have any comment? And uh, please, uh, uh, that was muted. No, I don't have any comment. <laughs> my any significant comment, I would say. My only comment is I would like to thank uh, here uh, our uh, Eisner colleague, Professor uh, Ninad, here again, right, uh, for this uh, lucid, I would say, lucid presentation. 
even myself, right, the solid mechanician, <laughs> I could understand the way you presented this, Nina. This is this is beautiful and wonderful, and I think this uh, this presentation can instigate further collaborations with uh, our colleagues uh, in Eisner. For instance, uh, you spoke about uh, DLC coating side, right? and uh, one of our principal investigators, <laughs> as you know, Professor Sugimura, is a world expert in the behavior of these uh, coatings especially when they are in uh, severe environments, right? gaseous environments, and so on and so forth. So I'll, I'll report to Professor Sugimura so that uh, you can, perhaps you can begin a new collaboration here. So, and uh, of course, I've got also some questions, but uh, since your office is next to mine, I'm going to ask you these questions in person. Okay. <laughs> okay. Not, I thank you again. I thank you on behalf of all my Eisner colleagues, I, I thank you. This was a wonderful presentation. Really, you, you helped us invigorate our webinar series. And uh, we look forward, uh, all of us here, to maintain uh, our contacts with you and, of course, uh, continue on uh, this uh, <laughs> webinar series presentation that uh, brings uh, so many, I mean, exceptional leaders in in the fields i thank you again thank you thank, thank you, you thank you everybody for having me and uh, thank you for listening thank you petros and uh, takahashi sensei and yeah i look forward to continuing collaborations and going back to japan one day okay thank you uh thank you everybody uh it's time to close uh, this uh, great uh, webinar thank you <laughs>